Thanks and pros and pipes and stuff. I'm glad you're here today. And the crew benefits here. It's a privilege to be here to open the Word of God and to study it further. We're, we're on the same unit. Christ is raw, but we're on a totally different um, set of verses. Uh, and we won't get to much of it today, surprise, surprise, right? But we're going to start. It's a very familiar portion of Scripture. It's in Luke um, 6. And I've just pulled apart of one of those verses there for our title today. For the next couple of weeks, you see where it was founded upon rock. So we'll turn there. Are you going to need to try to grasp the slides here? But um, we can see in Luke 6. 46 through 49, you see these words, and why Jesus says, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? <clears throat> Whoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you who he is like. He is like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid a foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently upon that house, it could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. We remember that in another place. Remember the, the song of the sea. What does that song go like? Wise man, his house is on the rock. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, this, these verses really are at the conclusion of um, something that's called the Sermon on the Plain. Um, we talked about this maybe a year ago or so, Wednesday night, Sermon on the Plain. It is similar to um, um, just a few of the points on the Sermon on the Mount, which is in Mark or Matthew, me, Matthew 5, um, I believe 5 through 7, is, is really long in Matthew. It's extremely long. In the, in the Sermon on the Plain, which is in Luke, Luke chapter 6. Um, you have some identical thoughts, but it's a whole lot shorter. And both have the Beatitudes. We remember what the Beatitudes are. We're not going to talk about those today, but that, that's kind of the background of what we're, what we're seeing here. This is the end of that um, sermon that, she, that Jesus gave. You can see here what's called Sermon on the Plain in verse 17 of the same place, same place, Luke 6. And he came down with them and stood in the plain in the company of disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. You see that now. now if you read that in Matthew, you'd see he stayed up on the mountain and he just talked to his disciples. But he was his disciples plus a great multitude of people. He came down from that mountain with his disciples and um, preached this sermon. The idea is here, Jesus, we see Jesus doing things usually once, but a lot of these points as he traveled town to town, he was talking about the same thing. And so um, the Beatitudes may have been taught 15, 20 times. <coughs> Don't know that because they were important. That's why they're in scripture. And, uh, and the other things that Jesus taught, not just taught the one time we see him, we, we don't have a complete list of everything done by Jesus, right? We, we simply have what the Holy Spirit inspired men to write and to preserve, and then put them into this, into what we call the Holy Bible. So anyway, that's what we're doing. Um, and so we, we come back to this slide, uh, the two slides, um, we read, uh, we're going to read it again. There's a reason that we are because it, it's really a, some definite things here that are very important to us as Christians. Very, very important 
to us. So as you read it to yourself, I'm going to read it out loud, but as you read it to yourself, um, take a look and say, it's, it's speaking to us. Okay? And Jesus says, why call you me Lord, Lord? And do not the things which I say. Whosoever cometh to me and hears my, my saying and does them, whoever does them, hear me and you do them, I will show you to whom he is like. He's like a man who built a house. He dig down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently on that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on a rock. Now we see the word rock there. You know, we won't get this far today by any means, but that's why we're using this in this these particular units as Christ is the rock. We know that that foundation is the rock. Right? It's Jesus, the rock, okay, built upon him. Now, how do you know that? Look at the first part. If you hear my words and do them, you built it upon the rock. Whose words? Jesus' words, right? That's the rock. Okay. <clears throat> And, but he that heareth and doeth not, this would be a disobedient Christian. All of us tend toward disobedience, even if we don't want to. It's, it's in our nature. And with time, a lot of that, a lot of that, which is wrong, some of that goes away. A lot of it can go away. If we really see God's will in our lives and do it and we know it, what happens it becomes that's our new law. Right? But we're doing that. Why? Because we keep seeking it. Right? We want it. We desire it. And uh, it becomes our habit. It becomes the way that we live. Um, but we have to start somewhere. And then we have to continue on. Um, the man that, uh, that doeth not is like a man that is without a foundation. He built a house on the earth against which the stream did be vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Okay, so some thoughts just going into what we're going to do. We're going to talk really about this verse. The topic of this, this verse right here. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? I'm not going to about it in a negative way at all. There's some negatives there, right? I mean, that's um, that's really neg- that's kind of a, a line drawn. And, and as Jesus, our Savior and God, is drawn one, it's drawn that line. So we should pay attention to that line. It means a great deal in our life. Um, what do you think? Think about this. In that verse. Take a look at it, examine it, let it kind of sink down into your thoughts. This is the only correct relationship between those calling Jesus Lord is very briefly and eloquently stated here. There's a relationship here. If you're calling me Lord, let's make it positive, then you'll do what? You'll do the things I say. And later on, we find out that it's like a man that built his house on the rock. Right? And it's sturdy and steady, and it goes through all the storms of life. But um, we, we see here that is the relationship. Right? Now, now, that's our relationship to Him. He is our Savior. Understand that? He is our Savior. Um, he is our brother. Um, we're adopted into His family, we are co inheritors. Right? Who cares? Um, but this is also, this is our relationship to Jesus Christ, our Lord, that He is going to say, see, the things I say, He says, and we do. Yes? If He's our Lord, think about it. He says, we do, that makes Him our Lord. Right? And so that's the only proper relationship that that we have in that verse. An actual Lord has the say. Now I want you to think about that. When he says, it's not always a command. But everything he says is a command. 
but it's not a command that says, you better do that. Right? Sometimes it's just directions on how to live your life. Does Christ provide directions on how we should live in Scripture? Yes. That's what he says. The things I said. Right? So he's, he provides direction. There's direction provided. Does somebody give me one of his directions? You don't have to quote Jesus, it's all by him. I mean, the red letters. Give me some direction from Jesus. We all know these. No, but a neighbor as thyself. What's an old What does that mean, though? Hey, the way you feel about it, you take care of everything. You make sure you eat your warm enough, you, especially on today. You've got some hot chocolate with you, and you. You get a, a place to live and, and sleep, snuggled in in the fireplace, maybe, and taking care of what? You don't let the neighbor the same way. But Jesus says, in, uh, or Paul does, he says, you know, you love yourself. You do love yourself. You, you may not be that way. Internet. So, what, what's another thing? What? Pray. 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 Isn't that now? Why would he tell us that? It's important. Without prayer, how do you read it? Right? What's up with it? Something else that he says. These are what he says. And if we don't say it, then we're not, he's not our Lord. You understand that, right? You must do it if he's your Lord. And if you don't do it, he's not your Lord. So there's a there's a problem. You can see a problem. Read scripture, attend, exhort one another, be kind, forgive. I mean, think about the things. What? Spread the word. Spread the word, absolutely. Just wait a minute. Stand about that. Follow, follow, right? Follow. What does that mean? As I'm doing, you do it. Right? As I'm doing, you, you should be doing also. Um, so the problem is stated in the question there in that verse. It isn't. It's an evident problem because Jesus said all of these at the end of all of these directions in the Sermon on the Plain. He says, "Oh, by the way, kind of sounds like that. Why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and doing the things I say?" He's talking to a big crowd. Not just the disciples, but the disciples are there too. Right? Here's my directions now. Now look, you're calling me Lord. You're following me around and calling me Lord. But you don't do it. That's what he's saying to you. You're not doing what I say to do. Okay. Um, Christ goes on in this parable in the next few verses, which we won't get to today. He goes on in the parable to illustrate what occurs in the life of a person who lives according to the master's direction. Is that true? That's what he says. The rest of the parable is, this is what will happen in your life if you're living according to the master's directions. That house that you built will be on a solid rock, won't matter what comes down the road. We just sang about that too. In the bed, down in the bed. And in the valley, not always good times. If there's storms are coming through there and, and bad times, but that house will remain firm. Um, and he compares it to the life of one that does not, does not follow. We're going to continue on with this thought. Little, I added this little, just kind of a song right there. We cannot be Lord of our lives. We cannot be Lord of our own lives. If Christ in truth is Lord, there's things we've got to stop also, right? We can't just follow us. That's what we always did before salvation. We never thought that. So Christ illustrates this very concept that we see here, that the Lord says it and we're to do it if he's to be our Lord. And, and he is our Lord, but is he Lord of our lives? Is he our Lord? 
Is see our master? Is see our Lord? Is see the one that we follow? Follow on. Um, he illustrates that very concept throughout his earthly ministry in his relationship to the Heavenly Father. So Christ modeled it also in the three and a half year ministry that he had. He modeled what our lives should be like. And we're going to look at at least one of those today. And if I get to stay on topic, we may get to the second one, but we'll at least get to this one. And it's found in John 8. And we see some verses here. There's uh, four verses, so we can look at the verses. Um, John 8, verse 26 and 27. Jesus says, I have many things to say and to judge of you. You see the word say again, right? I've got many things to say to you. That would be directions. And we call them commands, but it's directions. I have many things to say to you and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. And remember, what we're looking here is Jesus modeling our relationship to Jesus. He models it with his relationship to the Heavenly Father. Okay? So he shows us that. Remember, Jesus always said, the things I say is from the Father. The deeds I do, I've seen the Father do. Well, it's always he was obedient unto what? In obedient to who? Yeah, not to himself now. Now he's God too. But remember, he voluntarily took that place. He was less than the Father while he was in the body. And it says that in Scripture. It doesn't mean it was not God. It means while he was on the earth in that body, he had given up some stuff. Yes, he didn't. He didn't give up his God. He gave up what he could do anytime he wanted to because he's God. He did it. So he could do what? He could teach. He could die. And he would be raised again. He, he, he gave up. So, so we see <clears throat> that <clears throat> he is going to speak the things that he says that we just talked about, his directions. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. So the directions that I say to you, I receive from him. You see, there's some modeling going on already. And then for the next uh, line, they understood not in respect to them by the Father. And then the next two verses, then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. Look at there. Nothing of myself. Isn't that what we just talked about for us? I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone for. I do always those things that please him. So let's look at those two verses. And we're going to go back um, to, let's see how I did this. So we'll go back to these first two verses. And we see this again. I have many things to say, Jesus, and to judge of you, but his and is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him, and should not be expected in the Father. This is what some of the thoughts that are contained here. This is, first of all, we see here, it's his first public announcement of the crucifixion waiting him. That's interesting. I learned that as I was reading through different um, commentaries and um, outlines that <clears throat> it's the first time you talk about the he crucified the first time. We talk about it other times, but this is the first time. Um, and he says here that this first, this event will convince many who then doubted or did not understand his words. 
in his words that he had spoken earlier was that I am the sent one. I am the promised Messiah. But the crucifixion or commencement, those of you that are once in that class, we talked about crucifixion quite a bit um, several months ago. And the uh, apostles and a few more had witnessed much of what, got to what Christ did. But when he was crucified and risen from the dead, it was beyond any argument. That he was exactly who he always said he was. I'm God's son and the son of God. I'm the promised one that uh, you see um, in Deuteronomy, Moses said that there will be a prophet raised up from among you, and you'll follow him, or there will be some consequences, but they wouldn't follow Moses. Of course, they were at times following Moses, but there they was rebellious Moses too. But that was a among you, there'll be a prophet arise. That's Jesus, right? And the Jews were always looking for that prophet. And they knew that he was going to be called the Messiah. They knew the Old Testament um, scriptures, the prophecies about that Jesus is coming. But um, they they did not. Um, you know something? I don't know. Don't you wonder why I was saying all that? Good gracious, I'm so sorry. We already knew that. We're on, we're on here, verse 26 and 27. So I started in 28 and 29. We'll get back to that. So here we go. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. So here's a brief description or, or translation of that. There's much more that I will, that will be done. Jesus is saying, there's much more that will be done and said at the proper time. But now, know this, what I now say to mankind is just the message given to me by the Father. Okay? So, <clears throat> what I'm telling you right now is just from the Father. There's more I'm going to say. And there's more that's going to happen. Crucifixion is next. What, we, what I just jumped ahead and talked about. There'll be more, but right now, this is what the Father wants me to say. Do you, do you see how that shows that obedience that we're talking about? That, that, the, that the Lord says, Jesus says, and we obey. We simply follow. He says, do it, we do it. Right? And, and, and we know that we know this. That this is not horrible stuff. This is not stuff that we're going to be ashamed of or that's going to be beyond our, uh, our ability. This is going to be always for our good. Right? Don't we know that? Everything God does is righteous. It's right. It's good. It's for our benefit. And all that glorifies Him. When we obey Him, an invisible God, when we obey Him, let our lives be shaped by Him, through the Holy Spirit and through scriptures, and he's working on us all the time, sometimes with chastisement. But when we begin to change into that new person that we became, we became a new person when? When you guys say, born again. But when we become that person, when we begin, when we begin to be that new person, what new person? The one that stops following ourselves. The one that just does everything on a whim. Everyone's doing it, I'll do it. Um, everyone not doing it, so I'll do it anyway. Just whatever strikes me, I'll do. That's the old person. When we stop that, when we start clinging to what Christ does, what Christ says, and we do that and it shapes us, that glorifies the Lord. He, without force or beating us up with we without weapons or cruelty, changes us into a brand new person that literally glorifies the God of all creation. And he does it simply through love and through grace and mercy and long suffering. He waits on us, he chastises us, he, right? And, and that's what all of this is about anyway. It all comes down to He's saying it, and it's all for our, for the good. It's all for righteousness' sake. 
No, in the end, for, for his glory. But there's more that will be done. There's more that I'll say. But right now, this is the message that I'm telling you now is from the Father. It's from the Father, not from me. And then we go to the verses that I skip ahead on. We see him talking about the crucifixion. When he had lifted up the Son of Man, that is talking about crucifixion. There's another sense of that word, that phrase, but it's not true here. You can lift him up when you speak about him. You can lift him up in your life, right? You can praise him, lifting him up, but this time of crucifixion. When you have lifted up some of them, then shall he know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. So we're looking at those verses. I say and do what the Father has taught me always. Now, we're saying that, look, Jesus is modeling for us what our relationship to him should be. It is in his will that is our relationship. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not things I said? He's telling us what the relationship is. We fall short of it. That's the problem. We fall short of it. That's the problem. So here's the modeling. I always, every breath, every word, everything I did was according to the Father. Always. No exception. Now we know he was without all. He was without sin. We are not. We are not God. We are not Jesus. We are not to stay. We have to overcome things. But he allows us to overcome them. Right? And he um, causes us to overcome also sometimes by the way that he, he works in our lives. So, I say and do, Jesus says, I say and do what the Father has taught me always. There is nothing of myself in my message or in my actions. I don't say it and I don't do it unless the Father has said it. Now, look, that's supposed to be our relationship. To our Savior, that same relationship. Okay. I want you to see the word taught. It's about halfway down. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. He that sent me is with me, etc. But let's look at the word taught. As my Father has taught me, the word taught brings in another word for us. Day, and we may get to it briefly just right at the end. But the word taught is really the same you know, thought, the same word as master. The word master means teacher in scripture. So when they, they say master, master, they're saying teacher, teacher. Remember one of our guest speakers talked about um, the followers of the teacher. There would be this teacher. And the one that got closest to the teacher, followed along closest, got more dust on him. Yeah. Right? Remember when you talked about that? That was the younger of the two. I forgot what name was. What? Alex. Alex? Alex. Okay. Um, but we see here um, the word master, the, the word um, taught. So we're seeing um, teacher that. Um, the student, the student here would be Jesus. Yes? But God taught, God the Father taught the Son. He's the student there. He's, he's following the Lord, right? Everything he says, everything he does, every day, for all of his life, exactly obedient to what the Father has taught. So the, the, the figure here is, or the idea here is, that God is the master. A teacher, master teacher, if you want to call him that. Right? He's the teacher, he's the professor. The son is the is the, the one that's learning, he's the student. Um, and so continue on. The life of Jesus on earth as a man shows his relationship with the Father in heaven. The life of Jesus on earth as a man. Shows his relationship with the Father in heaven. 
God is Lord, and Jesus does and says all that the Father commands or teaches. This also illustrates an immediate child-father relationship. Right? It's, it's all breaks down to being obedient. And we know what Jesus said about that. The, the ones that are obedient to me, those, those are the ones that love me. Right? The ones that love me are the obedient ones. Obedient ones. So we can throw that into this too, but it's all that same thing. Um, if he's your Lord, in fact, it proves your love. It proves your love. So, so think. So, so think. Let, let's go back to that. Just real quickly, we can go back. Why did I have to go to the moment? There you go. Let, let's look at this. this because this is our title. This is our thought for the day. We're, we're talking about the Master, Lord, Master. When Jesus says it, he's also teaching us, right? When God said something to the Son to do, Son, do this. He is teaching him, this is what you're to do, do this. When Jesus teaches, when Jesus says something in Scripture, he's teaching us. So he's not only our Lord, if we obey, he's our Lord. But in any case, he's also our master because he's our teacher, right? So Jesus is our master and Lord. Master and Lord. If we do what he says, right? We can hear it and not do it. And that's like the man that built on no foundation, right? But what we hear and do, of course, we we'll all the solid rock. And then we see another step to take an understanding of this concept is this. If he is Lord, he is also master. In Jesus' actions and in his commands, his teaching. When, when he performed the miracle, he was teaching. He was teaching, right? You were learning. He's able to do that. He can heal. You're learning that there may be something else. Because sometimes when he heals, he would then have this discourse about what he just done. There will be teaching going on. That's that's the master concept. He's the master. Um, in our obedience, though, in our obedience and in our following, he is both Lord and Master. Both Lord and Master. And that's kind of what we're after today. If you would turn to John in your Bible, Bible John 13. This is a very, very familiar portion of Scripture to you. Um, and we're going to read it with, with the idea of looking to um, the same notion, the same idea that we've, we've done so far today. And that is that in order for God to be truly your Lord, you must hear what, he's, what he teaches and obey it. In that case, he's both your Lord and your master. Listen, what else could be teaching us? Forget the Bible, forget it. But what else teaches us? What? Examples. All right. Forget about the Bible. Something else is in our life. God the Holy Spirit. Forget about the Bible, say. Yeah. I'm not talking about I'm talking the about world. The Spirit. Don't we learn? You all, we know this. I've used this example before. At one point, we would never have talked about abortion mixed sex in public. You wouldn't have done it. In, at one point, you would have never, ever seen nudity on television. It wasn't there. There may have been hints, but there wasn't much because it had been censored. The radios that people used to listen to all the time, the words to the songs weren't filled. They were, you couldn't get on the air. If you had the wrong beat in the song, some song, not nasty words, the beat of the song was banned. The, the, 
the song we made. I mean, things have changed. We have grown numb to it. We don't even get embarrassed when we're here. It's just part of life. Now, where did you learn that? You know. And we will. That's what we learn. We also learn from our parents. We learn from our best friends. We learn from the enemies. We learn from textbooks. We learn from all kinds of stuff. So there's other things. There are other competing masters out there. Who's got control of this junk in the world? Say limited control, control nonetheless. Limited time, but he's this still his time, right? Until that day, that he that is. So when we are bombarded with all of this stuff, it's in competition with the power the Lord and Master has. So why is it so hard for us to make it truly our Lord? Because of that. And because of sin that dwells within us. Paul says it this way, within my body dwells no good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now he ain't not talking about the Holy Spirit, he's talking within us. Right? No good thing. So no good thing here, no good thing there. It's hard for Jesus to become our master, our teacher alone. In the Lord, we obey what we what we learn, what we heard from Him. Always in, in competition. Um, so John thirteen. Let's read this twelve through seventeen. <clears throat> so after He Jesus had washed their feet and had taken His garments and was set down again, He said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Remember, Jesus never did anything just to do it. He did that. That was the time. He limited everything that was a point to a big, big deal. It was always a big deal. You know, know me what I've done to you? Now look here. You call me Master and Lord. And ye say, well, for so I am. What did he just say? I am your only teacher, and I am your only Lord. That's what he said. I am. That's who I am. And if he says it to them, he's saying it to you and me as believers. And then he says this, verse 14, If I then as your Lord, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. See there? He said his life shows us the path. Follow on. We just sang it, right? The path is shown in his life. We can't ignore even small things that he did because there was a purpose to everyone healed. There was a purpose for every action he took and every word that he spoke. This purpose. And all of us to, to do this is to lead us. We would, that we would believe, number one, then number two, take our rightful place as followers, not of self anymore, of him. So that the rest of me to follow him. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that sent than he that sent him. So we see that, right? Do you see that's the same conflict as there? In our title verse, our subject verse, Right? That there is someone that's greater than us, and we can't switch it. <laughs> if we take our own way, we have made ourselves greater than our God. It does matter. Why? Jesus is teaching about it. He lived it. He talked about how he lived. He showed us how he lived. And now these verses that were, that there's no doubt, I am your master. But remember this, you're not greater than me. I just washed them and built your feet. Listen, looking at those verses, look real quick. Same chapter, but look at this. Look at verse 3. 
This is after supper. They finish eating. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things in his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, listen, he's, he is getting all because of his work. He's, he, he's going to be crucified, right? This is right, right after that. We go to all of these verses leading right to the cross. All of these chapters, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And then we have Gethsemane and the arrest and the crucifixion and the resurrection. But what we see here at the supper, he knew inside, he knows, he said, I've got it all. All power is given unto me. That means all, really all authority. It's all mine because I'm going to pay for it. Yes. On the death, with the death. It's all mine. That's the man that right here is going, takes his, his, his robe off and, and, and washes filthy feet of 11 disciples. Yes. There's some humility being shown. He shows us how to live. He shows us how to live. As our Lord and Master, he's teaching here. He's teaching, and one of the things certainly is, yeah, I am your Lord and Master. Number one, don't forget that. You can't be greater than me. Do what I'm showing you to do. I'm teaching you. And remember this, Jesus is going to be teaching every single moment he can from chapter 13 right to the end. And then he comes back. You remember? He comes back and he teaches for 40 more days. All of them with his disciples. And, and not just the apostles, you know, but those that would follow him. Yeah. Boy, day after day, nothing but gold coming out of his mouth, right? This is how, this is what we do, this is the plan, this is what, and that's what they did. That, that's the, what they obeyed, doing. So he is definitely the master. And if you don't put yourself above me, if you don't put yourself above me, I am your Lord. Right? We see that. The servant, verse 16, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither is he that is sent greater than he is sent. And I want you to think about it. He's telling them something. Folks, I've got uh, disciples, I'm sending you. When I leave, did he send them? Yes. You're not greater than me. Preach me. Yes. Preach me, disciples, because I'm the one that should be preaching. I'm the master. I'm the Lord. Don't preach yourself. Verse 17. If you know these things, have you? Are you? If you do them. Uh, and so that, that's the way to the, 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 the correct existence for it. And I want you to. I want to read just a, one or two little things here that other people wrote. Um, uh, I hope it's still on here. Yeah, it's still on here. Okay, the, the foot washing has been taken and made into a, a silly thing by some churches where they literally have these very, very calm, solemn, man comes down and washes the feet. That is not what he's talking about here. He is not talking about literally washing anybody's feet. That is not what it's about. Uh, listen to this. These are again people that know more than me saying things like this. Um, But more when they have washed twelve men's feet, they cruelly torture all Christ's members and thus spit in the face of Christ Himself. This is Calvin wrote this. It's a ceremonial comedy. It's nothing but a shameful mockery of Christ. At any rate, Christ did not enjoin an annual ceremony here. He's not telling anybody to wash feet, but tells us to be ready all through our life to wash the feet of our brethren. And that doesn't mean that either. That means do what the brethren need. They're in need of. They're a brethren in need. Anybody here ever have needs? Every one of us does. And there's others that even worse off than, than we are probably. Um, uh, 
we like the disciples will gladly wash the feet of Jesus, and he tells us to wash one another's feet. Right? Anything we do for each for each other that washes away the grime of the world, the dust of the feet, and the discouragement is foot washing. Spurgeon says this, it's easier for us to criticize those with dirty feet instead of washing them. In the world they criticize. This is the business of the public press. It is very much the business of private service. Hear how gossip say, do you see that spot? What a terrible walk that man must have had this morning. Look at his feet. This is all symbolic. He has been very much in the mire. You can see there are traces upon him. That's the world's way. Christ's way is different. He says nothing, but takes the basin and begins to wash away the stain. Do not judge and condemn, but seek for restoration and improvement of the air. See, brother and sister, they're out of the way. Look, there's a bunch of not here today that are not sick. I'm not talking about that. You know that. There's people that are here. You have relatives that are they're, they're believers, but they are out of the way. Christ is not their Lord right now. I don't mean that they're not doing what he says to do. They're out of the way. They need washed up. That doesn't mean the rag in the basin of water, right? Okay, so we'll stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for this time together. We thank you for your words. Help us, Lord, to lead our life to love that's shown by our meekness. We praise you for all that you do. Thank you.